welcome to Tea and Strumpets, a Regency Romance Review. I'm Zoe. And I'm Kelsey. And we're back today to talk Main Lane. Uh, Kelsey, it's been a minute since we've done our reoccurring series. It's been a long minute. Yeah. Do you have a guess as to when we last did a Maiden Lane book? I feel like it was halfway through last year. <laughs> okay. It was a little sooner than that. September 29th. Oh, September. So it's literally been six, almost exactly six months. Yeah. I can't believe that. I mean, it's just crazy. Well, so there was a lot of other really good books to read and like other fun things to discover, like Halloween lists and governess lists and all fun things. And then there's the holidays, and uh, we did not get our act together because there's so many different little Maiden Lane holiday things, but I feel like we're still going to be <laughs> traipsing through Maiden Lane by the time the holidays roll around again next year, so maybe we'll catch it then. Well, you know what, Zoe? I feel like we're going to put in a valiant effort because, listeners, you're not going to get one Maiden Lane this month. You're going to get at least two, maybe three. Woof. Oof, I don't know what that three is, but I, uh, I'll I don't know. guess we'll On be the talking list later. of things that you wrote down for March, you did write down three Maiden Lanes. Not one, not two, but three. No, 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 no. I actually wrote down four because initially oh. we were going to do March, Mad <laughs> March Maiden Lane Madness. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, yeah, we that was a little too much for us. Uh, yeah, and I now think we're I doing... said no, Zoe. That's too much. <laughs> yes. And now we're doing our aunties in between our main episodes. So I think we can we can securely say two Maiden Lanes this month uh, and hopefully another one again soon. Yes, that is the goal. We'll see if that happens. We're ambitious people, guys. <laughs> and the exciting thing is that these two next Maiden Lanes are just... Mwah. Uh, they're so... Uh, I read this one and I was so excited for the next one. I'm yes, I'm so ready. Me too. So the book we are talking about today is Maiden Lane number six by Elizabeth Hoyt, Duke of Midnight. Yes. So today, I'm going to take us aback. So it's a history fact, but it's also explaining something if you do not know. So often in our romance series, we have a lady's companion, whether they are a heroine in their own right or somebody side character or something like that. We have a lady's companion. But what is a lady's companion? I have decided to give you context. <laughs> A lady's companion was a woman of genteel birth who lived with a woman of rank or wealth as retainer. The term was in use in the United Kingdom from at least the 18th century to the mid-20th century, but it is now archaic. The profession is known in most of the Western world. The role was related to the position of lady-in-waiting, which by the 19th century was applied only to the female retainers of the female members of the royal family. Ladies-in-waiting were usually women from the most privileged backgrounds who took the position for the prestige of associating with royalty or for the enhanced marriage prospects available to those who spent time at court. But ladies' companions usually took up their occupation because they needed to earn a living and have somewhere to live. A companion is not to be confused with a lady's maid. Only women from a class background similar to or only a little below that of their employer would be considered for the position. Women took positions as companions if they had no other means of support. As until the late 19th century, there were very few ways in which an upper or upper middle class woman could earn a living, which did not result in a complete loss of her class status. The companion's role was to spend her time with her employer, providing company and conversation to help her to entertain guests and often to accompany her to social events. In turn, she would be given a room in the family's part of the house rather than the servants' quarters, all of her meals would be provided, and she would eat with her employer, and she would be paid a small salary, which would be called an allowance, never wages. She would not be expected to perform any domestic duties which her employer might not carry out herself. In other words, little other than giving directions to servants, fancy sewing, and pouring tea. Thus, the role was not very different from that of an adult relation in respect of the lady of a household, except for the essential subservience resulting from financial dependency. Ladies' companions were employed because upper and middle class women spent most of their time at home. A lady's companion might be taken on by an unmarried woman living on her own, by a widow, a married woman who lived with her husband and sons but had no daughters and desired female company, or by an unmarried woman who was living with her father or another male relation but had lost her mother and was too old to have a governess. That last is the case in our book coming up. 
In the last case, companion would also act as chaperone. At the time, it would not have been socially acceptable for a young lady to receive male visitors without either a male relation or an older lady present. A female servant would not have sufficed. That is a really great description, and we got most of that from our good friend, Wikipedia. <laughs> yes. I did also, I put that there, and I might put it up on Patreon. I didn't have a chance to read it, but it was actually very interesting because it is a blog about confirmed bachelors and female, comp it's called Confirmed Bachelors and Female Companions, Queerness in 18th Century England. And it talks yes. about how, you know, a lot of female to female relationships, like lesbian relationships could be disguised by having just that companion. They'd be in close quarters all the time. It gave them ample opportunity. So I thought it was interesting. And so we might just share it for those who are interested. Yeah, there's definitely got to be some interesting cases of that. I've I've always been interested. I'm pretty sure I've read some books that that was the case. It sounds very familiar, even if it's not necessarily the main character. I think I've seen some side characters. So, so very cool. Mm -hmm. All right. But our book today, our main tropes are revenge, an unsuitable bride, secret identity, and class differences. Not huge, but actually, yes. Yeah, I didn't initially put those because they're technically of the same class, but she is, but she has reasons why her class status would be diminished. Yes. Speaking of her, our main characters are Miss Artemis Greaves and Lord Maximus Batten, the Duke of Wakefield. Oh, is it Wakefield? God damn it. I put Westfield. Damn it. You sure did. As I'm reading it, I'm and like, it's mm. all over the place. God, I was so, I was like, because I wanted to say it was like West something, and then I just knew. Oh. Okay, Wakefield. We got it. It's fine. It's Wakefield, guys. I just, I just read this book. Kelsey read it a little a while ago, but we have got you here. And in fact, we don't have any trigger warnings really for this book. There is some stuff in this book, um, but we don't go into it in our, in our synopsis, so we're not going to include that. But there is some stuff uh, that happens in Bedlam, which is a insane asylum. And some beatings uh, that happen there, but that isn't included in our synopsis. So uh, uh, more about that in the next book. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so Kelsey, shall we take it away? We shall. Artemis Greaves cannot believe she let her cousin Penelope talk her into going into St. Giles? Giles? <laughs> God damn it. I pause every time because now I just don't even remember what it's supposed to be. I'm sorry I had to I, – I let you hang, but it is Giles. Thank you. <laughs> God. I feel like I just need to just uh. – okay. It's okay. Take another sip of wine and yeah, go at it don't again. Don't worry, guys. We're drinking <laughs> wine during this podcast, or at least I am. So It's okay. I've taken a muscle relaxer. So, yeah, this is a late night record, everyone. We're feeling so. loosey-goosey, y'all. <laughs> From the top. <laughs> Artemis Greaves cannot believe she let her cousin Penelope talk her into going to St. Giles at night. You got it. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> the woman would do literally anything to be considered daring and gain the attention of the Duke of Wakefield, the youngest, richest Duke on the market. These are the thoughts she has as she is preparing to fend off three men bent on accosting them both. They never even managed to get a taste of gin, which was the whole objective of the evening after a bet gone wrong. However, things get more interesting when a certain ghost of St. Giles, <laughs> yep, <laughs> when a certain ghost of St. Giles makes an appearance. He approaches her and helps her stand. Then, as he turns away to fend off Penelope, who jumped on his back, the ring from his small finger comes away in her hand, and the ghost runs off into the night. As they find a hack to leave St. Giles, 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 damn it. <laughs> As they find okay, wait, hold on. Let's 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 pause because we we can do this, Kelsey. Let's come up with some sort of um, oh, what's it called? Um, oh gosh, um, a th you know the thing to make you remember a mnemonic, right? Uh, the ghost g, it's not the ghost of Saint Giles. It's the ghost of Saint Giles. It's not the same sound as ghost. Does that work? This is not a good mnemonic. <laughs> no. What I need to just remember, it's Giles, like in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But it's of course, there you go. reading and saying are two different things. Okay. 
well. I think it's just nor because doing this stupid podcast and I've seen it so much and I've messed it up so many times that now I just don't remember what it's supposed to be. I like see the word and I have insta panic. You've got this. It's <laughs> ghost like vampires like Buffy. Giles. Giles. You've got this. <laughs> However, things get more interesting. Oh, no, wait. I've already read that. As they find a hack to leave St. Giles, Artemis looks up and sees the man known as the ghost watching over them to ensure their safety. Back at home, Maximus Batten is kicking himself for losing his father's signet ring. His whole life since the murder of his parents has been about finding the man responsible for their deaths. He's also the only remaining ghost haunting St. Giles. Now, some quick background on Artemis. She is the granddaughter of an earl. Her father had the courtesy title of Viscount, but because his father did not approve of his wife and also of the way he lived his life, he did have some mental instability. They were estranged, and Artemis grew up with little money. She also has a twin brother, Apollo. Her brother is currently in Bedlam because he is accused of killing three men. This happened shortly after the death of her parents, and her grandfather never responded to her letter requesting help. But luckily, a distant uncle, Penelope's father, had her brother declared mad in order to avoid the noose. Now, Artemis finds herself as Lady Penelope's companion and is only slightly resenting her lot in life. However, it affords her the ability to see her brother and ensure that he is at least minimally cared for. Okay. Now, Artemis and the Duke are constantly being thrown together. He is pursuing her cousin, who is beautiful and vain and a little bit silly, but she loves her anyway. However, Penelope has the right pedigree, which is why she is considered appropriate for the Duke. However, after meeting Artemis as his Duke persona, Maximus is immediately drawn to her. But because of her mad brother, she is unsuitable to be the next Duchess of Wakefield. Maximus is obsessed with doing everything perfectly as Duke because of the guilt he feels towards his parents. Artemis also finds herself confessing things to the Duke, like telling him about the ring the ghost lost in the rescue. That night, she awakens to the ghost looking through her bedroom. The ring is on a chain around her neck, but she does not offer it to him. Instead, they talk, and she is intrigued by this man that London fears. A short time later, our main characters are together at the Duke's house party at his country estate. Maximus is out the first morning of the party and comes across Artemis, sans shoes, roaming the forest. His dogs seem to have a knack for finding her wherever she is. Maximus and Artemis chat, and this pattern continues as the party goes on. Things get interesting when Artemis realizes that the Duke is the ghost. While fencing with another party attendee, he shows his more lethal nature. That, coupled with the ring she found, allows her to draw this correct conclusion. While normally Artemis would keep this information to herself, Wakefield... See, I wrote Wakefield there. Wakefield is a powerful man. So powerful, he may just be able to get her brother out of Bedlam. So she blackmails him. Maximus is not amused and really does not feel like she's much of a threat. After all, who would believe a companion over a well-respected duke? A companion and also the sister of someone who is mad and had a mad father. So there's a lot of instability in her family. So why would anyone believe her at all? Exactly. Artemis gets more desperate, though. After initially broaching the subject with the Duke, she finds out that her brother is dying. She has no details, and when she tells Penelope that she must go to her brother, Penelope tells her to forget him. Her place is with Penelope and distancing herself from the mad Viscount. So Artemis ups her blackmail game, becoming more blatant with her insinuations about the ghost's identity in front of the other party guests. Maximus drags her into the woods during an outing with a few of the other guests and asks her what she thinks she is doing. She tells him about her brother being on his deathbed. Maximus swears, kisses her, walks back to the group, and tells them he has urgent business in London. That night, the ghost of St. Giles breaks Apollo Greaves, a Viscount Kilborn, out of Bedlam. Artemis is close behind, having convinced Penelope to lend her to Maximus's sister Phoebe while her aunt is away. Phoebe is the sister that is going blind, if you might recall, from Hero's book, Maiden Lane, number two. Now that Artemis knows that Apollo is safe and can heal in peace, she and Maximus confront each other. And by confront, we mean bang. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Uh, the Duke does not offer her marriage. In fact, he's very upfront about the fact that he will not offer her marriage. Uh, but Artemis does not care. The sexual tension and the explosive kiss were all she needed to offer herself to the Duke. So now they are under one roof and they are getting busy. 
This is helpful because part of the Duke's quest of redemption is to put his mother's emerald necklace back together. It was stolen when she died and broken apart. He has all but the last two pieces. After returning home as the ghost, and finally, after almost 20 years, meeting the man responsible for his parents' death, Maximus tells Artemis about the necklace. The highwayman, Old Scratch, is to blame and still wears a piece of his mother's necklace. He shows her the pieces, and Artemis gasps and jumps out of bed. Returning, she gives him one of the two missing pieces. Her brother, thinking it was paste, gave it to her on her on their 15th birthday. Maximus finally has a clue to tracking old Scratch's identity. Mm-hmm. Maximus gets his lead from Apollo and continues his quest to find old Scratch, while Artemis is learning that her relationship with Maximus is not going to be a secret much longer. And while he's stated that he'll buy her a house and make her his mistress, she loves him too much to watch him marry not just another woman, but her cousin. We finally arrive at the climax of our tale. Maximus is getting closer to finding Old Scratch. Artemis is getting ready to leave forever, when everything comes together at heart's folly. Maximus follows his lead of the provenance of the necklace, which actually leads him to heart's folly as he's as he's tailing one of his queries. Artemis is there with Phoebe when Old Scratch, who is actually an aristocrat, Lord Noakes, tries to kidnap Phoebe, but settles for Artemis instead, because he actually knows also that the Duke is the ghost. He drags Artemis to a boat as Hart's folly burns around them, because he also set that on fire. You know, like villains do. Mm Mm-hmm. Maximus arrives to see Noakes using Artemis as a shield while holding her at gunpoint on a boat. But Artemis is not someone to underestimate, and she throws herself into the Tums. Maximus just about drops dead at the sight of Artemis going underwater. He knows she can swim, but she is in heavy dresses in a river and immediately jumps in and saves her, completely forgetting about his vendetta. He cuts her out of her wet skirts and brings her to the surface. There he is hauled into a boat by none other than our other favorite ghosts. Turns out Godric is just as bloodthirsty as ever, and he killed Noakes before he could escape. Quote, but both men looked over inquiringly when Maximus spoke, but I never asked you to help me with Noakes. Makepeace nodded, his expression grave. You didn't have to. You never had to, St. John concurred. Ah. Yes. Once home, Maximus proposes to Artemis and tells her how much he loves her. The moment he thought she was gone, everything else ceased to matter. She happily agrees. And that's it. And when we return to Main Lane, we'll catch up with our other favorite Olympian twin. Oh my gosh. Okay, you kept it short and sweet. There's so much to discuss. But first, shall we adjourn to the parlor? We shall. So we want to say a big thank you to all of our patrons because we've already managed to hit our first goal of the year. Um, We had, we have more than 25 patrons now, and we're really looking forward to doing our first full length bonus episode for those patrons as a reward at If you join, you can still also listen to that bonus episode at any time. When you do join our Patreon at any level, you get access to all of the perks that have been rolled out to our patrons, um, you know, based on your specific level. But something like this is for all of our patrons, so any level, it's going to be available for you. And patrons, if you haven't yet voted, please head over to our Patreon to cast your vote for which book we're going to be doing. And if you have not yet received your mail perks. I, Kelsey, am working on it. I swear you will get them before the end of March. That is my goal. I am sorry. There's a lot of you and things happen. Yes, please be patient. I'm working on it, I swear. (laughs) Yes, we love you all and we are working on it. And also a big thanks to everyone who participated in our uh, reading survey that we have so much great data and information from that. I'm compiling it. Uh, We did... um, have a drawing for some prize packs for that. And um, just randomly, it picked four international people out of five. So we have packages going off all around the world. And I just 
really want to say thanks to everyone for your time in in answering that. It was really, really awesome, and it's going to help us a lot. So if you want to find us anywhere, you can find us at T as in Tom, N as in Nancy, Strumpets, pretty much on any platform that we are. So that's Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and Patreon. Fabulous. All right. Kelsey, you said it at the top of the show, but it was the same for me. This is one of those Maiden Lane books that you kind of just have to read the next one right after it. You can't stop. I Yeah, this was where... So, readers, let me tell you what happened. We started Maiden Lane. As you know from that first episode, I hated it. Which is why I had never read the entire series, because I hated book number one. Now, number two, I will admit, was better. Number three disappointing because i was so looking forward to it yep um number four good and then things really hit a stride Mm -hmm. like i really liked number four loved number five number six good lord that's the one we're on now and then i fucking blitzed (laughs) through the rest of them (laughs) like it's yeah there's definitely like it's an uphill trajectory i feel like i don't know i i think like maybe number eight i i did i read six and seven just like i just had to keep reading them and then i was like am i ready to read phoebe's book right now i remember it i said i'm just gonna wait till closer to when we record to Mm reread that one because i don't remember I i remember like positively about it but anyhow we're not talking about phoebe's book we're talking about maximus and artemis the isses um (laughs) the isses So my general thoughts on this one is that it was really good. It's such a banger. Like, the characters are great. They have, like, real legitimate, like, conflict and trial and pain. And you just believe it. And their chemistry is so good. Oh, yeah. And the ghost stuff and Artemis' stuff, you know, like. And I know we're going to talk about this lady, but I know. And I know we're going to talk about this later, but. It was so steamy. Like. So steamy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, completely agree. Um, yeah, it was just it made this book made me happy. And the the disappointing thing is that I did it started me on a reading streak, which then I immediately read the next book, and I cannot get that book out of my head. That book is so like I just you I told like, me about it. Like so when I started reading all of them, because remember Zoe had read all these before I did. So all of these were like kind of first reads for me. And although now I've read them all, so technically by the time the notes happen, they're technically like almost second reads, but I'm not reading them in depth. I'm just skimming them to write the notes. Anywho, Zoe was like, oh my God, Apollo. And I was like, oh my <laughs> God, Apollo. So <laughs> That's going to just, like, tantalize you for our next episode. But Yeah, and we're probably going to say, oh, my God, Apollo a million times. Uh, Although I have some deep I have some deep thoughts about Apollo now. Anyhow. <laughs> That's OK. We're going to we're going to discuss it later. Yes. So let's what are what about you? How did this book hit you? I thought this book hit me really strong. Again, I liked the plot. I liked that it was kind of quick, like. It really flowed really well, and it was kind of like, as you saw in the synopsis, writing the synopsis was so easy, even in a detailed sense, because it wasn't a lot of little details like I feel like the earlier ones did. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. You could really, like, it really was like, here, here, here. Yeah. There were a lot of small details that, honestly, like, there are some little twists and turns and there are just a lot of little moments like between the Duke and Apollo or like between Artemis and Apollo that are, and it's not just all about Apollo, but even like Artemis and Penelope or Phoebe, um, those are like really interesting and they move the story along and they don't make you roll your eyes in the way that some of the, some of the kind of interludes Mm -hmm. did in the earlier books. They're great, but are they necessary for our synopsis? No, no. But do they make reading the book so great? Yes. Yes. And I will say this because like in all the other books, we do have a third party kind of start giving their insight. And then that leads us into whoever gives the third party view of what's happening. Mm -hmm. They are the 
one of the people of the next book. That's how she does it. So you kind of are, you get, you're introduced to the character from their point of view before their book, which is great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And oftentimes you're introduced to them before you even know them at all. Like, this is your fr- like this is the first time we've ever heard of Apollo. When Artemis was talking, it was kind of the first time we learned about Artemis, you know? And yeah. so this was really great, but I will say that third party view really was central to the story continuing. It wasn't kind of like a random break where you're like, where is this going? It was actually very much in line with what was happening in the story and it did not deter away from the rest of the book. However, in order to keep the mystery alive and to keep my job easier, I did cut Apollo's view out. But, you know, things happen. But all it is is just, you know, so much more wonderfulness uh, for people to discover as they're reading this book. So and it's interesting because I was thinking, I know we're not talking about Apollo's book, but I have Apollo's book fresh in my mind. And there are so many characters like that we don't necessarily get it from their view but in apollo's book all of a sudden we see asa make peace who we haven't really seen we've we heard of, of him tangentially mm-hmm. through all the make peace he's the black sheep of the make peace family and now we get to learn more about him but also valentine napier the duke of montgomery and he's gonna be have his book later and there's i think there's even a third character that might pop in that's important later oh hippolyta royal is in this one so you're get you're getting all of these people who like are just peppered in and the world is so rich hippolyta never got her own book she gets a novella oh she does oh i didn't read it yeah Oh, oh, yeah, she gets a novella. Because I was like, she doesn't have a book. That's upsetting. She's talked yeah. about so much. <laughs> she gets a little novella. Uh, and I remember it being satisfying and different. Um, so I think she, there's something either that she elopes or she runs away or she's kidnapped. Oh, okay. Uh, so there's, there's a carriage. Mm-hmm. Uh, anyhow, let's talk about our hero and heroine of this book. What do you think of Maximus? Okay, I really like Maximus. My one fault with him, Mm because I could tell you about all the great things about him so much. My one fault with him is how much he clings to this notion of the perfect duke and the perfect dukedom. You get that such, you get that impression, but it's literally in his head. And of course, Mm -hmm. by the time he's saying, like, I cannot prove my love to you, Artemis, because I cannot marry you because I need to have that perfect duchess on my arm. I owe it to the dukedom. You're like, the fuck, dude? The fuck? (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. He... He's got this, like, righteous indignation of a 14-year-old who saw his parents murdered and whose parents got murdered because of him being foolish. Um, So, like, I get it. Like, he's scarred. He's traumatized. Like, yeah. And he's there's a part of him that's stuck as that 14-year-old boy. And it is really irritating. Um, But, yeah, there's something about him, too, though, that's, like – just compelling and sexy and I, interesting and his relationship with Artemis is always very open and honest mm-hmm. like as soon as he she realizes he's the ghost and she's like okay and I love that she's blackmailing him and he's like how can you even blackmail me and then she's like you will do this thing for me because you can and he's like fine yeah <laughs> And I think, too, one thing I will say that I loved about him is because oftentimes when you get these dukes where they're, like, trying to embody whatever, like, daddy issues they have or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. they're trying to embody that perfect dukedom. They, yep. I'm literally reading another book of that right now. I'm reading Kingston's book. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> that we were talking daddy about. Daddy issues. Daddy issues. Daddy issues. And, like, cold and, like, can't tell anybody that they love them. Yeah. yeah no. Yeah. <laughs> and I will say this about him is the thing is. And that's something I really enjoyed about him is he's very kind and he's actually very warm. Like he has very high standards, but that doesn't stop him from noticing things and commenting on them. Like one of the things he really says to her right at the beginning is that he asks her – or he's at the, as the ghost at the time, but he's like, oh, why are you in this back room? It's almost like a servant's room. And she's like, oh, you know, poor relation, blah, blah, blah. But he's actually really upset by the fact that she's dismissed because he knows she's a lady's companion, but she's of a similar station to Penelope. And yet she's treated like such uh, like almost she's very much treated like a servant, even though she is a companion. 
It's really funny because I just got to the part in uh, the Loretta Chase book about the Duke of Kingston where he moves his secretary to a better room oh, yeah, because yeah. he's so upset about the fact that she's in this terrible – and then he gets her a nicer office too. Yeah. And, but then he also gets all the other servants upgraded furniture. Yeah. So – Anyhow, uh, it's yeah. There's there's a trope there. I don't know. There's some. Maybe we need to name one, like the the daddy issue Duke, or like. <laughs> oh my god, we should do a list of daddy issue Dukes. Oh my god. Oh my gosh. <laughs> How, okay, future list episode. We need to write that down somewhere before we forget. Daddy All issue right. Dukes. <laughs> I'm writing it down. Daddy <laughs> issue Dukes. This is super funny. Okay, we've got two. <laughs> yes, at least. Okay, I'm, there's plenty more, but okay. Let's talk about Artemis. Yes, Artemis is fire. Like, she is strong. She is she's courageous. Amazing. She is always herself. And even when she's dealing with Penelope, she doesn't be someone else. And she truly does love Penelope, even though Penelope is this silly, vain child. And it's so funny because even though, and that was one of the biggest things, not only because she's like, oh, I can't watch the Duke marry my cousin, but she's like, I can't do that to my cousin. Like she like is so upset by the idea of Penelope finding out because it would hurt her. And even though Penelope is Penelope, she can't like, you know, she's just a good person. Yeah. No, Artemis is is fairly selfless and like she's accepted her lot in life and she's really smart and she's just really wonderful. I love the way she protects her brother. It makes mm-hmm. sense. They're twins, you know, like they have a bond that's maybe even a little bit stronger than, you know, just a brother and sister. Um, And I think that she is just amazing. Like, I love that she blackmails the Duke. I love that she kisses the Duke. I love that she starts a relationship with the Duke and decides going into the relationship that, yeah, she'll be his mistress. Yeah. You know what? That's an okay thing for her in life. And then she realizes, oh, I actually can't be this guy's mistress because I like him too much and because he wants to marry my cousin, who I love. And I can't do that to her. And so that I think is really wonderful. And so she's just like, it's not like this, I can't be with you. I can't see you with another woman. You know, she's like, but I, I can't, her, her reasoning is actually, I love these two people and, and therefore I can't do this because it would hurt one or both of the people I love. Mm-hmm. And so it doesn't work for me. Yeah. So anyhow, loved it. We didn't rank Maximus or rate Maximus or Artemis. What would you rate them? I'm going to give them both nines. No way, me too. Oh, yeah, well, there we go. <laughs> yeah. I loved this book. And like, I thought that they were tens, honestly. Like, I came out of this book like so happy, so tens. But then I read the next one. <laughs> and like, I love it more. So I feel like there has yeah, to be I think some that, like, distinction. You know, it's funny. It wasn't until we were talking about them where they really clearly got nines to me. And then I was like, boom, nine, hundred percent. Yeah. But um, yeah, and I get that because they weren't tens because it wasn't like I came into this being like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh god. But yeah. I really loved them, and rereading the book was so great. I mean, not rereading it, skimming it. Like I actually was like tried to remind myself to keep skimming instead of like get involved and read it because I was like, you don't have time. You got to get this shit done, and you're just refreshing your memory from the last time. <laughs> So, but it was like, it really drew me in and the two characters drew me in. So 100% nines. Excellent. Do you have a favorite quote you want to share? Yeah, I'm going to share two. Um, They're from the ending and I think they just embody the characters. It's a little Mm -hmm. bit of Maximus being his daddy issue self, but you know, it's fine. Um, Mm -hmm. Quote, you'll take his part before mine. Oh, he knew it was a mistake even before the words left his lips. Her shoulders squared. If I must, we shared a room. We're flesh and blood, tied together forever, both physically and spiritually. I love my brother. As you don't me. She stopped, her chemise in her hands before her. For a moment, her shoulders slumped, and then she raised her head. His goddess, his Diana. When you've tired of me, she said softly, precisely, Apollo will still be my brother will still be here for me. I'll never tire of you. He said, knowing he said, knowing with every thread of his soul that he spoke the absolute, absolute truth, then prove it. But he doesn't because he still says he can't marry her. 
ask, mm-hmm. I forgot about the Diana thing. What's wrong with Artemis? Like, why I, does he have to call her Diana? I, you all know, the it's time? funny because I feel like if her name was actually Diana, he'd call her Artemis because they yep. are the same. So, yeah. you know, I know. But, but it was like, really funny because I was like, I love that you just keep calling her Diana, but it's it's a pet name because he can't call yeah. her Artemis because that's her actual name. Yeah. So he's just calling her right. a name. Yeah. And then I'm going to read the proposal. <laughs> Okay. Then Maximus did something very strange. He went on one knee before her. This isn't right at all, he said, continuing to glare as if he found it all her fault. She sat up. What are you doing? Artemis Greaves, will you do me the honor of... Are you insane? She demanded. What of your father? Your conviction that you must marry for the dukedom? My father is dead, he said softly, and I have decided the dukedom can go hang. Yes. Redeemed yourself, Maximus. Yes. Finally, he has come to his senses. So I have two. One's really short and one's kind of long. So I'm going to start with the long one. And this is just at the house party. It's a really lovely just moment and piece of writing. So the Duke of Wakefield seemed unaware of the stir his singing made in his guests. He casually leaned over Phoebe as he read the music he held in one hand and the other placed affectionately on her shoulder, and when they negotiated a particularly intricate passage together, he caught the grin Phoebe threw at him and smiled in return, naturally, unselfconsciously, almost joyfully. If he'd never been the Duke of Wakefield, was this how he would have been? A strong man without coldness or the driving need to dominate and control? Loving and happy? The thought of such a man was strangely alluring. But even as she considered this phantom being, she caught the Duke's gaze and knew. It was the man as he was now, flawed as he was now, that she longed for. She wanted to clash with his dominating nature, wanted to run with him in the forest, wanted to challenge him mentally and physically to games of their own making. And the coldness, staring into his autocratic eyes, Artemis wished with all her heart, if she could, she'd take his coldness and make it her own, transform it into a heat to engulf them both. Ah, yeah, that was great. I also just have this one little sentence about Apollo and Bedlam that I just think Elizabeth Hoyt is such a cinematic writer. She just transports you. Mm -hmm. There were those who compared Bedlam to hell a writhing purgatory of torture and insanity. But Apollo Greaves, Viscount Kilborn, knew what Bedlam really was. It was limbo, a place of interminable waiting. Ugh. Yeah. Ah! Anyhow, it just uh, gives me chills. I love, I love, love, love. And <laughs> now we get to talk about how steamy this was. Yeah. Because this was... It was hyping so steamy. hot. Oh my god. Guys... There is one scene, she is sound asleep, and he is out being the ghost, and he comes in, and he literally lifts her out of bed and <laughs> brings her to his own, and then he does not make soft, sweet love to her. Uh-uh. He is a man in charge, and he takes <laughs> what he wants. Ugh. And she is 100% there for it, willing, and like... All of it, anyhow. Oh, and And then they have a really heart-to-heart afterwards because she's like, oh my God, great, you needed that. That was amazing. I had a really good orgasm and so did you. But also, can you tell (laughs) me what's wrong now? Like, oh, spicy. Hot. Yeah, no. It was fabulous. And there were three encounters. Yes. Three very descriptive encounters. There were other implied encounters. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're at our feminist recap. This one's definitely a supporter. 100%. Um, It's... Just like empowering women and like I talked about Artemis and her decisions and how she felt about herself and the people around her. And also, you know, there's there's like things about class. And I think also just the way that Elizabeth Hoyt writes about the lower classes and the difficulties and kind of the the terribleness and bedlam and that kind of stuff. Like, you know, she's shedding light on some of the murkier things and and I think even that just makes it a little bit more feminist in in its writing because it makes you like take a hard look at things and realize like how bad it was for people. And I don't know. I like works that make me think. Yeah. And I also really think, too, because it is very clear that the rumors of her relationship with Max are spreading and the gossip is true, but it's spreading. And the women around her literally rally behind her. Mm-hmm. They sure Even do. when Pe- Penelope finds out and 
throws it in her face and like slaps her and yells at her. <gasps> oh. And Penelope's Duke is and like, Penelope's I do not Duke. tolerate this. Oh, that was such a good moment. She ends up with an older man and he's fabulous because he, apo- like she does that and he gives her a set down. He apologizes to Artemis and he takes Penelope home. And then before it even says, all the women around Artemis who she's afraid are going to leave her, uh uh-uh, they close ranks. They're like, nah, girl, you with us. Yeah. Well, we loved this book. There's a lot of great moments that we didn't even talk about. I hope if you haven't read this book, you go out and read it because there's a lot of wonderful to explore. And now we both loved this book. How high are we going to rate it? I think I'll go first. I'm going to give it a 9.5. Oh, my God. That's what I was just thinking. Like, literally, I was like, what will I rate this? A 9.5. Like, I really, truly enjoyed it. I thought it was fabulous. I really, like, the whole story really comes together. And it's like, and it's a quick one. It's not hard. It it draws you I in. Feel- it continues in that nice, easy pace. But it's got I intrigue. Like- it's got fun. It's all the things. It's got everything. Yeah. Like Stefan would say on SNL. Um, but no, actually, like, I think this book is pretty close to perfect. And I would probably rate it a 10 across the board, like, if the next book didn't come right after. Here's the thing. <laughs> I'm not saying that the next book is a perfect 10 and all the characters are perfect 10s. I might not rate them that high. I just love that book. Like, mm-hmm. And that book just like sits with me and doesn't leave me. And I'm always thinking about that book. And it's just like one of the most memorable books that and I ever read. And that's what gets it a 10. If it doesn't leave you, then mm-hmm. it has to be rated very highly because you can't mm-hmm. stop thinking about it. But this one also is up there. Maiden Lane, man, coming at it with these high-ranking books. And as we said, next time we're reading – the next book review we are doing is Darling Beast by Elizabeth Hoyt. (laughs) Yes. So you'll get to learn all about what we're talking about with Apollo and his lady love very soon. Very soon. So thank you all so much for listening. And join us next week for an Andy and then – Soon after that, we'll be reading Darling Beast by Elizabeth Hoyt. And may all your ever afters end happily. 